Welcome to Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree, where we talk about gospel insights through great stories and help you find entertainment that is both true and beautiful. Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree is part of the Public Square Media Network of podcasts that seek to bring an LDS perspective into the public square. I'm Liz Busby, here with my co-host Carl Cranny with another short episode today, and this time we are covering The Most Reluctant Convert. It's a 2021 film about C.S. Lewis's conversion to Christianity. It is adapted from a one-man stage play, which in turn was based on Lewis's autobiography, Surprised by Joy. And the playwright, Max McLean, plays Lewis in the film version. So, Carl, what did you think? I was pleasantly surprised by this one. I have my doubts about the ability of plays to exist in the in in the the visual medium of TV and movies. For every Hamilton, you get I don't know. There there are other examples I'm sure I could pull if I thought enough, where it didn't translate well from the theater to television or movies. Okay, we could go with a very LDS reference and say for every Hamilton there's a 1970s Saturday's Warrior. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> yes, which I only ever saw the the movie version, so I never encountered it in its native form. But it's interesting to tell you just started the introduction, I did not realize that the playwright was the guy playing Lewis and he did such a good job of doing his own play and they mixed in uh, all the sort of background stuff of 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 scenes from the, that he's describing, and you're watching it go on as he's talking. It worked really well for me, just as as an autobiography of Lewis. Or I guess it's autobiography now filtered two two genres removed from the original book, but it does a good job of leading you through Lewis's life and his thought and his conversion and how it all ended up working out in the end. So I liked it. Yeah, I thought the style was really interesting that they chose to start with the setting up of the movie and then it's straight the whole way through. And then at the end, there's a cut and the cast little party thing going on. Just an interesting choice. Yeah, it's a technique that Kenneth Branagh uses in his Henry V that mm -hmm. I thought worked pretty well to good effect. I'm not sure that the framing of the movie with that sort of visual inclusio was as useful here as it was in Henry V, where they have Derek Jacobi playing the narrator, the, there's a chorus figure, and he starts off on a movie set and then says, welcome to our play. And then you, he's always wandering around the moors of England dressed in modern garb. So you're like, oh, that's the narrator again. It's Derek Jacobi. He's doing his thing again. In this case, if it had just started on him talking once the movie really begins, I don't know, that would have diminished my enjoyment of the movie anymore. I agree. I don't think I necessarily would have included those if I was the one making the movie. I was reading some reviews of the movie and one of them called it basically an illustrated monologue. And I was like, I'm okay with that. I like illustrations of pretty English places. I'm okay with Oxford and watching pretty Oxford buildings while Lewis talks to me. That is my style of film, but it is a particular style of film for sure. It's not a drama. Sure, but at the same time, I feel like we do this in documentaries all the time where there's someone who talks over pretty pictures of birds. David Attenborough talking about birds as you're watching these very fun feathered birds from the Amazon rainforest do their mating dance or whatever. There's a reason we like documentaries and things, and this isn't quite a documentary but it feels like a cousin in some ways. And so, yeah, it works. I'm here for it. It's just a documentary about one man's interior monologue. And as weird as that sounds, it totally works. Yeah, and it's the same way that Surprised by Joy reads, because in his autobiography, he doesn't cover a lot of the day-to-day -day events, and he's not very concerned about that stuff. He's more concerned about his intellectual transition points. Um, and so it fits really well with what Lewis wrote, um, whether that's very visual or not. I don't know. Yeah. Well, they've certainly made it visual and I think it works wonderfully. And it's interesting when you're doing an autobiography of your conversion, you wouldn't hit the day to day stuff. There's only a couple of concrete instances where he says, I was in this room talking with this guy when I first had to admit that there probably was a God. And then it was on this road trip from point A to point B, 
And when I got to point B, suddenly I believed in Jesus Christ. And I had not at the beginning of that road trip, but it just walks you through his changing mindset and intellectual approach to these things. And that works well to hit the highlights. When If you write your autobiography of a particular theme of your life, you're going you're gonna to be skipping across your life as a whole. Anyway. So how much did you know about Lewis's conversion before you watched this? I've read Surprised by Joy and read most of Lewis's books. So this was a nostalgia trip for me. I was like, oh, yep, now we're at this <laughs> point in the story. Now we're at this point in the story. Oh, yay, it's Addison's Walk. I'm so excited. I've been there. <laughs> it's awesome. But what? W- how familiar were you with the story? And what was your experience with the story itself? So for me, I was aware of that phrase, I knelt down to pray the most reluctant convert in all of England. Somehow, even though I haven't read Surprise My Joy, that phrase had filtered into my consciousness somehow. So I knew that he had come to it not willingly, not of his own volition or accord, that it was forced into it. I didn't know under what circumstances. So this was a lot more of an intellectual conversion to me, which was interesting. And one that resonates with me quite well, frankly, but I recognize that may be an idiosyncrasy of people like me and Lewis. I don't know that the average person is converted by intellectual argument to Christianity or theism in general or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but I was, and I am, and Lewis was, so I like him. <laughs> that, that, that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I agree. I definitely have had to recognize that not everybody is a Lewis person. I first came to reckon with this in a book club where I was like, oh, we should read a C.S. Lewis book. And someone was like, oh, no, I hate his books. I just don't get them. They're too long winded. He loses me. And I'm like, oh, it's beautiful. But for <laughs> a certain kind of person, it's very comforting to see someone who's intellectually active, really engage with the argument and come to the belief that faith is a defensible position, a reasonable position, not the only necessarily reasonable position, but a reasonable position. And that's where he ends up. Yeah. And I like that about him because I cannot tell you, just to be autobiographical myself, how suspiciously I am looked upon when I arrive in a new ward because they're like, you're getting a PhD in religion? Well, now I have a PhD in religion. So we'll see what happens in my next ward. They look at me askance, like they're just all waiting for me to leave the church or become one of those progressive Mormons or ex-Mormons. I have no intention of doing so. I think the restored gospel of Jesus Christ is quite true in every sense of the word and easily defended in an intellectual way, which is how I resonate with it and how I view the world. I recognize that I'm a severe outlier in the church, and it usually takes me a couple of months to a year to earn everybody's trust in the ward, that I actually am like a believer in all of this stuff. And so I guess part of me has holy envy for the Church of England for that sort of thing, because they're way more into that than we are as Latter-day Saints. (laughs) Well, I think it's important that we have all different kinds of faith journeys, right? If you only had the faith journey of intellectual ascent, then that would leave a lot of people out. And so it's also important to have different reasons for joining the church and have all those kinds of stories. And that's a reason that storytelling is so important and like writing things down, our own experiences and our own conversions and sharing those. Um, That there's lots of different ways to come to the church and to share that with people. 100%. And that is why his sort of reluctant convert moment in my life was having read the Book of Mormon for the seventh time as a teenager and realizing there aren't any flaws in it. Now, Turns out I've read it more closely, and there are like two, and it's really (laughs) subtle switches from first to third person. We're talking really noodly stuff, but I was like, this clearly is not a product of Joseph Smith. Mm. And that was like a moment that I distinctly remember. All right, I'm here, and let's do this. This church is true. I had the Spirit testify to me and had it talk to me. A moment reading the first vision and just realizing this was true, like those moments were there. But I distinctly remember reading it for the seventh time and going, Nope, this isn't ancient scripture, and it's true, and the only way it could be true is that Joseph Smith was a prophet, and an angel gave him gold plates, and uh, all right, I'm in. Let's do this. And here I am, all these years later. Now, though we've talked a lot about how Lewis's conversion is pretty intellectual, I think there there are is at least one other aspect, which is really interesting, is that he, part of his conversion is that he picked up George MacDonald's book, Fantasties, which is a fantasy novel. 
and was converted to this idea of wonder and imagination before pursuing the intellectual arguments they're into, which, of course, I really like as someone who likes science fiction and fantasy, the idea that wonder and storytelling like that, even if it's not specifically about Christianity, in some ways prepares our mind for Christianity and for yeah. belief. Yeah. And this is an argument Christians have been making for thousands of years. You read Plato and you resonate with Plato. And so turns out that some early Christian fathers are like, if you read Plato and you read the Gospel of John, you're reading the same thing. And I'm like, really? Are you? But are you, you know what? If, if that brings you to Jesus, then I am happy that you got to Jesus through Plato. I, d I don't care. God can work with whatever tools he has at his disposal. And if he wants to use Plato, then he's going to do it. This is maybe where I get a little off of Lewis's version of Christianity, because there are two things that I do not personally resonate with. And the one is that there is, is a binary in the universe, like you're either moving towards God or you're moving away from him. And the Great Divorce talks a lot about this, too, and I d do not agree. And we Latter-day Saints have a multi-tiered afterlife where it seems like God himself does not agree. If you want to end up in a mediocre place, we have one of those for you, right? Whatever it is in the good place, right? The, the medium place. The medium place, right? And anyway, we have that. And the other is the idea that we, if we have a longing for something that isn't here in this world, it must have come from another world. I don't think that's true. I think I can listen to a music piece and Rick recognize that the person did not play it perfectly and imagine the perfect version in my head, but the perfect version doesn't exist out in the universe in some platonic form. And so the idea that like justice and mercy and these uh, concepts that don't exist here in the world must come from some other world. I don't buy it. I, that doesn't resonate with me at all. And it does for Lewis because he's a more traditional monotheist. I'm sure there are Latter-day Saints who, who believe that sort of thing. I am not one of them. That's perfectly fine. I, I resonate with that just because I feel like we were made in the image of God, which means we're made to love God. And I think that's what Lewis is describing. We were made for relationship and for relationship with God. But there are lots of different ways to interpret what he's getting at there, I think. Well, right. You even say we were made. I'm like, but we weren't. <laughs> that that is one of the key heresies of of Latter Day Saints is that we. I'm sorry if I'm being too theologically nerdy here. No, go for you, it. You stepped into my world <laughs> now, Liz. But we weren't made. Whatever the core right. element of Liz and Carl seems to have always existed, and there are different sort of ways we approach the various scriptures and and ways the prophets have taught about what the eternal core of us is. But we weren't made for anything. That's a fair point. That is the major heresy the Latter-day Saints engage in, is we do not believe in the creator-creature distinction, like basically everybody else in the monotheistic world does. The other thing, though, that I think resonates more with Latter-day Saints, I have been curious to have seen Lewis run into a Latter-day Saint intellectual back at Oxford, which there weren't any, but if he had, he, oh, I have these things for justice and beauty and mercy and that don't exist here. They must have come from some outside world. And I want to say, what if you had been there and now you sort of recollecting it because he has no concept of pre-mortal existence and when he when the part of the movie came to that where he was talking about that sort of thing i thought this i feel like you could take that same thing and if you just tweaked it a little bit and said and this is your memory of what came before mm -hmm. then he would get on board with that as opposed to the more platonic ideal of there are these things out in heaven that we were made for and created to yearn towards. And I'm like, no, man, you just miss it. But that's an important difference. I like that. We could tweak him in that direction. And Latter-day Saints do like to tweak Lewis in our direction pretty frequently. <laughs> oh, yeah. We gladly count him among our adherents in the afterlife. I don't know if that's true or not. I'd like to think so, but we'll leave that to him and the Lord. Yes, yes. I wonder if somebody's baptized him for the dead. Oh, I'm sure they have. I'm sure Lewis would struggle with giving up his pint. That was a big deal for him. <laughs> but we, we'll talk to him about that in the afterlife and see how things are going. Okay, let's do a lightning round rating segment. Content-wise, celestial, terrestrial, telestial, outer darkness. Celestial. No, celestial. Maybe the, maybe the moment in, in World War I when a couple mm -hmm. guys get shot and, and there's like an explosion, but it's... It's even silhouetted and they're focusing on it. And, and he talks about how he sat there 
thinking, oh, this is the end and how like what that did to him intellectually. So it's not it's, I mean, there is a little bit of violence, but it's celestial, 100 percent. Yeah, the play version, movie version skips over from Surprised by Joy. There's some homoerotic moments in his boarding school with the younger boys being made to serve the older boys and pairing up. It's a little weird. It's not clear because Lewis is not clear about events. So it's like, what was this? Nobody knows for sure. But this is totally not in the movie in any way. But if you ever go read Surprised by Joy, it is in there. Artistic merit, one to five popcorn balls. I'm going to give it four just because I don't like the beginning and end inclusio of the framing of making the movie to make the movie. Just have the movie. It's fine. You you didn't need that. The rest of it was gorgeous and wonderful and kept drawing me in and helped me move along really quickly and was more entertaining than I thought a monologue about man's interior intellectual conversion to Christianity would be. Yeah, I think you definitely have to judge the artistic merit based on what it is. It is not a a biopic of Lewis where we're going to go through his life. It is very much a monologue, a one-man stage play filmed. I agree we should have cut off those beginning and ending moments, especially the ending one is very jarring after you're like really into Lewis has been just like talking straight into your soul for an hour. And then you're like, oh, what is going on? It was nice to have them pan over to his gravestone at the end. If that was what they were going for, I can excuse it. I feel like Lewis could have been standing there talking about it and he could have just walked off camera and it could have panned down. He could have had that without seeing the gaffers and the grips and the lighting and all the stuff. I feel like there are ways you could have had that nice moment at the end to see his final resting place without that particular cinematic technique. Although, of course, I think he's been reburied in Poet's Corner in Westminster Abbey. So I'm not sure if that's his grave anymore. So, hmm. Oh, fair. Well, there is something touching about it being his parish where he took communion for the first time as a full believer. And then there's the spot for him right outside that church. There's something nice and poetic about seeing that, whatever that is relative to his final resting place. And I think at least half of the artistic merit points go to just England and Oxford being like the most picturesque things ever. Uh, So you don't even have to try very hard. As long Um, as you have a halfway competent director of photography, it's going to look gorgeous. Yeah, you can't go wrong with these old buildings. Gospel Connections, one to five apricots. I think we have to give it five, probably. Oh, yeah. This is a great way to talk about conversion to Christianity and periods of doubt and intellectual wrestles, faith crisis, all this stuff. Yeah. It was so fascinating to me to to listen to the first 90 seconds where he describes his atheism and say, oh, that is exactly what Richard Dawkins would say today or Daniel Dennett or um, Christopher Hitchens, right? These arguments are not new. And this was before we discovered like how big the universe is. And this is before Hubble and the telescope discovered galaxies. And like the idea that the universe is a cold, dark and hostile place to life. He was talking about this in the early 1900s. He had no idea how cold, dark and hostile it is. And these arguments keep getting recycled over and over. There will always be enough evidence to think that, no, God did not create the universe. This is all just happenstance at random chance. And there will always be enough evidence to say, no, no, I believe there is some kind of creator and an intentionality to existence, and you have to pick. I think we Latter-day Saints do a better job of explaining why God is absent, like why he doesn't just show up and say, hello, my name is God, why don't you all stop killing each other? I've told you to in every religion, but he doesn't. And we have a coherent answer for that that resonates with me, but it's interesting to see that there's nothing new under the sun as far as that goes. It's the atheists of the early 1900s, late 1800s, or the same as the atheists in the 21st century. Their arguments are not novel or new. And sometimes I feel like the atheists of today think they're all that in a bag of chips because they've come up with this new cool thing. And I'm like, no, anybody who is halfway literate at all in the history of this intellectual tradition of Christianity versus atheism knows that we've just been recycling these arguments since Darwin, and that's fine. Who, by the way, was a believer. It is valuable to go back and read older stories and realize this is not a new problem. So much. This is one reason Lewis is always campaigning for read old books. For every one new book you read, you should read an old book and realize that they had problems back then. 
that were different. They made different mistakes, but some of it was the same. And humanity is the same throughout time. And then you don't get as surprised by the things that people think nowadays. Yeah. The past is a foreign country, but sometimes it's not that foreign. It's still populated by humans. That's right. Past is a foreign country, but still populated by humans. I love it. I'm going to take that. Yeah. Take it. Print. Cut. Well, okay. thanks for this good discussion. Thanks for indulging me in my C.S. Lewis obsession, Carl. I appreciate it. What episode number is this? We finally got a movie about C.S. Lewis that you finally tricked me into watching. It's great. Now we just got to get around to Shadowlands and Freud's last session. Coming up next season on Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree. <laughs> Indeed. And this has been Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree, encouraging you to seek after everything virtuous, lovely, of good report, or praiseworthy. We'll see you next time. Okay, well, this has been Pop Culture on the Apricot Tree, encouraging you to seek after everything good, lovely, uh, what is it? I don't remember. Virtuous. I know our sign off and I know the 13th (laughs) article of faith, I promise.